joining us again uh, in this webinar series uh, that is jointly run by the Wolf Institute and by the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean uh, with uh, additional partners, the CSIG IMF, the University of Munich, the Medieval Studies Research Group at the University of Lincoln, uh, the Leicester Medieval Research Center and Ghent University. And we have some people from Ghent here today with us. Um, so this is now uh, the third year that we're running these webinars. Uh, and many of you have been at many of these webinars, webinars before. But for those of you who haven't been, um, I'll just very quickly introduce the two main host institutions. The Wolf Institute is a research institute uh, in Cambridge, which focuses on religion and society. And we combine our research with teaching, public education, and policy work. Please have a look at our website, at our YouTube channel, to learn more about our work. And now with my other hat, uh, the Society uh, for the Medieval Mediterranean was founded in 1997. It is dedicated to all aspects of the academic study of cross-cultural Mediterranean history from the 5th to the 15th century. And this is also the moment where I introduce the Journal of the Society. Uh, actually, you, who is the chair today, was the previous editor-in-chief of the journal. Now I'm the editor, so I'm always advertising this. The journal comes as part of the subscription uh, of the membership of the society. So if you want to become a member and get this beautiful uh, volume, eight articles in the newest issue three times a year, uh, do consider uh, signing up. Um, you can find the instructions for that on our webpage. A very, very quick introduction of how this webinar works. We have a Zoom webinar audience, and we're also live streaming this via Facebook. So if you want to rewatch it, or if you want to recommend it to anyone to watch, it is available on the Wolf Institute Facebook page and soon also on the Wolf Institute uh, YouTube page. So our topic today is historiography and politics in the late medieval Islamic Mediterranean. And our chair today is Professor Jürgen von Steinbergen from the University of Ghent, uh, who is also one of the two co-presidents of the society. Uh, and he will in turn introduce the speakers. Uh, the panelists will present for uh, 10 minutes each and then we'll have a, a short discussion uh, among ourselves uh, with the chair while you can prepare questions for the Q&A session that will start afterwards. So please type your questions in the Q&A portal at the bottom of your screen because it's much, much easier for the chair to handle them uh, in that form. Uh, and at six o'clock sharp, we will end the live streaming and the filming of this event, but you are invited to stay behind. Uh, we usually continue a bit more of an informal chat uh, after that time um, to say also goodbye to one another. So you're welcome to stay. Uh, and then we'll usually finish about 10, 15 minutes after six. So it's now uh, the right time to hand over to our chair. Jo, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Miriam. Um... Uh, welcome everyone. It's nice to see so many people, so many known faces uh, or known names around here. My name is Jo van Steenberg, and as Miriam said, I teach at uh, Islamic History at Ghent University. I also welcome in particular our speakers, Kovat van den Bosse, Mohamed Balan, and Sebastian Garnier for this panel entitled Historiography and Politics in the Late Medieval Islamic Mediterranean. Uh, I think we can say that the four of us have devised this panel together in various ways uh, but one of the many reasons for me to be interested in this panel or for organizing it also has to do with a new series that uh, i've been involved in setting up a new book series i've been involved in setting up at edinburgh university press critical approaches to arabic historiography um, uh, together with my colleague muhammad um, sorry mustafa bannister from Utah State University. Uh, I'm the editor of this new series with Edinburgh University Press that um, creates or yes, wishes to create a forum for publication projects dedicated to uh, the study of Arabic history writing in the, the period of the 11th to the 18th century, it's basically the period after the disintegration of the Abbasid uh, Caliphate of the early Islamic Empire period that quite uh, unjustly so very often continues to be uh, uh, defined as a post-classical or post-formative period, a period of many, many changes, political changes, but also social and cultural changes, of many changes also in uh, the field of history writing in Arabic, um, changes that involve the volume, the substantial, the, the exploding volume of texts of history that are being written, changes in the genres and the, the, the blurring of boundaries between genres uh, that are being produced in this time period. Uh, changes that have also been related to the closer 
ties and connections between the art of history writing on the one hand and the world of politics on the other, the courts, the many, um, the many courts that um, that appear uh, throughout this this region and in this time period. Um, and uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, topics of research that have been developed and are being pursued today are certain, certainly this closer connection between the world of politics and the world of history writing and the question to what extent history writing in Arabic has been not just participating, but has been actively shaping the political cultures of um, the, the, the many courts uh, to which they were related not in the least the courts of the Southern and the Eastern Mediterranean. And that is basically also the topic of uh, the different case studies of this intertwining between history writing in Arabic and politics uh, that we will be, uh, that will be presented to us by Howard Mohammed and Sebastian. We'll have a case studies on, a case study on uh, by Barzal Mansouri, who was active in the early 14, late 13, early 14th century, in Egypt at the court of um, sultans, the Mamluk sultans in Egypt, we have a case study on Ibn al-Khatib, who was active in the middle of the 14th century, especially at the court of the Nasrid dynasty in Granada on the Iber Iberian Peninsula. We'll have a third case study on Ibn al-Shama, who was active uh, one century later in the early to mid uh, 15th century in at the court of the Hafsid dynasty in, Tun in Tunis, in Tunisia. And they all produced works uh, of history of universal, local and dynastic history in Arabic that were informed in many ways by common concerns of patronage and power, but also of legitimacy and memory. And these are uh, some of the topics that each of our presenters will be engaging. With. I will um, present each of them of them in some more detail uh, when they present, we will sort of follow the chronological order of these case studies beginning in uh, early 14th century Egypt with the case of uh, Bay Barzal Mansouri that will be presented uh, to us by Howard van den Bosse. Howard has a PhD in history from Ghent University, uh, where he worked especially on the writing of royal biographies, and his dissertation uh, won the 2020 British Association for Islamic Studies, the Greuther Prize, uh, which, and it has now been reworked into a, a monograph that has been submitted for publication. Between 2019 and 2022, uh, Howard was a postdoc in the uh, Knowledge Information Technology and the Arabic Book ERC project of Professor Sarah Savant at the Aga Khan University in London. Currently, Howard is a junior postdoctoral fellow of the Research Foundation Flanders at Ghent University with a project on history writing at the court of Sultan Nasser Mohammed ibn Kalaun in Cairo. And Nasser Mohammed who basically reigned uh, and eventually also ruled between 1293 and 1341. And it is within this context that his case study of uh, the writings of Bay Bazal Mansouri in Egypt uh, have to be considered. Goart, the floor is entirely yours. Thank you very much Joe, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, thank you very much for having me on this uh, on this uh, webinar. Uh, it's it's really really great to to um, present my research in a context where we can look at the, where these these uh, these uh, developments in historiography we see in Egypt where they might um, um, intersect with developments elsewhere in the on the in the Arabic speaking part of the Mediterranean. Um, so, um, as announced, my talk today, today will be about by Basel Mansouri, who is a, uh, a major historian of the um, late 13th until early 14th century. He died in 1325, um, and he was uh, strongly connected to the court of Nasir Muhammad, uh, especially during his second and third reign. Um, and I am studying him as part of a larger project on universal history writing um, at the, at the, at the, especially during the third reign of Nasser Muhammad. And for this, I'm looking at um, four uh, his historians. So, uh, in addition to Bible Salman Suri, there's Abul Fida, Nuwairi, and Ibn Dawadari, uh, about whom I will not have anything to say about. But today, um, I talk about Bible Salman Suri, who is most well known for writing. Um, a text called Zubdat al-Fikra fi Ta'arikh al-Hijra, but there is a curious phenomenon uh, with that text in the sense that um, people have generally uh, 
only approached it for what it has to say about uh, Mamluk history or late medieval history. That is to say the, the period in which Bayer Mansouri himself was alive. Um, while in fact, Zubdat al-Fikra is not quite a universal history, as we shall see, but it's nevertheless a very substantial history. Um, it was originally probably 10 or 11 volumes, about half of which survive, uh, but only one of them has been properly edited. Um, so here we have an, an overview of the, the text as we can assess it today. We have volumes four until seven. We have more or less in full, um, but with some gaps. Um, we do not have the first three volumes, not, and neither have we, do we have the volumes following volume seven, but we do have the final volume, which is either volume 10 or 11, it, which is somewhat un unclear. Um, and we do have two manuscripts of that, um, one of which is, however, quite recent. All the other manuscripts are, uh, are, are uh, single known manuscripts and are also, um, also actually all of the same set. Um, this is an interesting phenomenon where we, um, where, which we can see if we look at the title pages. Uh, the, the manuscripts are now spread all over the all over the world. One of them is in Uppsala, one of them is in Paris, and one of the, the third one here is in Istanbul. Uh, but you can see by the the, the program that the the um, decorative program of the title page that this is clearly the same uh, product that was. Uh, we don't really know uh, whether it was offered to the court of, of Nasr Muhammad, but it seems quite likely, considering that in addition to the title Zubdat al Fikra, Fi Tarikh al Hijra, which is noted on the top of each title page, there is also a specific mention of the Dawla, the state of uh, uh, Al Malik al Nasr, al Nasr Muhammad, at the bottom of the page. Um, and an interesting phenomenon in this uh, text as well is that. Each volume actually gives a very brief digest of what it contains. Um, and so on volume four, we get a list of the Abbasid caliphs that are being dealt with, while on volume five and seven, we get the names of the Fatimid caliphs that, will, that are dealt with in that volume. The fact that the Fatimid caliphs are highlighted already shows also that this is a very Egypt-focused history, even if in fact it, it posits to be a history of the Islamic community. Um, also, the other manuscripts, with the exception of the recent volume that is in Yale, are also of the same product. And we can see this, by the way, their layout functions. Um, we can see this all, they all have 17 lines per page. They use the same uh, bold headings. And there is a very extensive uh, red rubrication, which in the earlier volumes tends to be in, the, in margins. And then in the final volume, uh, moves into the body text. Uh, I don't think this means that there are separate productions, but rather that the copyist changed approach throughout copying the text. Um, that where, whereas he was correcting himself in the earlier volumes, he actually followed the program that he, in which he had to correct himself for the final volume. Um, <clears throat> now, as I as I highlighted already, the Subtitle Fikra is not quite a universal history, but in fact, how do we know? Because the first three volumes have not been preserved, so, so it's difficult to assess. Uh, the reason I, I, I think this is the case is because um, in the introduction, to his uh, to the final volume, he he does give a bit of a, a taste. He gives a um, an assessment of what he aimed to achieve with his text. Um, and I've I've translated it here. Um, so it starts with the, an account of the Turkish Egyptian state, uh, uh, and then how it uh, it's commenced in the Egyptian lands and and is spread to the Syrian lands. Um, so he gives a bit of a, a digest there what what he will be talking about, and then he notes that. Uh, um, that he has been working on this project, he said, through the aid of he who is endowed. Um, sorry, there's, I can't quite see it here. Endowed with loftiness and with uh, and strength, I have exhaustively treated what I chose from the correct reports in this book of mine, which I've been able to compile, and which I became very attached to establishing, and which I have given the name the choices, the choices notion on the history of the Prophet's migration. And then I, I dealt in it with the succession of the years of the Prophet Muhammad's community until I arrived at the luminous Turkish state, which, which is established today in the Islamic lands. And then there follows several lines of praise to this particular state, um, which, and then he, he, he he uh, closes off these remarks, which, which, with the, the expressing a desire that he wished to give proper order to its sequence of kings and to order its conduct. Um, so he he specifically has an endeavor here of writing a very large scale history in which that state in which he lives and in which he is a very uh, important part himself. He was a he was a an important state agent and a member of the of the elite class that dominated the state. Um, he expresses a desire to make sure that that state takes up its rightful position within uh, the um, 
the, 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 the greater view of history. And in fact, we can see that reflected in his broader historiographical output, which is something that hasn't really been studied. There hasn't really been a comparative study of its entire output. Um, so that output contains not only Subdat al Fikra uh, in, in its, you know, in its not entirely preserved state, but still substantially as uh, possible to assess. He also wrote a, a text called the Tuhat al which is a, a monograph, historical monograph, and that is only of the Turkish state. It's, it starts in the year 650 and it goes up to the year 709. Um, so that's, that's in Hijra, uh, Isla Islamic calendar, so from the mid 13th until the early 14th century. Um, and so here he foregrounds specifically that uh, Turkish state as, as, a, as a topic that is worthy of a monograph in itself. He additionally also wrote a universal history, Muhtar al Akbar, that is, that is a very interesting phenomenon in which we see uh, the, the connection with his amanuensis, a Coptic scribe, uh, quite clearly expressed. And he also wrote a hadith text that is very strongly historically inclined. Um, so it, in my project, so um, I'm trying to assess how uh, Baibras Mansouri dealt with these different scales of history across his text, and whether we can see some kind of larger project at work here, as, as has been assessed, assessed, for example, for Al-Makrizi in the 15th century, or whether it is more of a, an ad hoc situation. Uh, but in any case, it's clear that he tended to... Uh, to want to claim the, the importance of uh, his, his own period in a larger view of history. Um, well, and I will leave it at that and, and hope to um, receive questions after this. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hoart. Um, so in case anyone has any questions for Hoart, you can already post them in the Q&A uh, platform. Um, which you find a button for at the bottom of your screen, but we will uh, keep all questions until uh, after the, the three presentations. So we'll move directly on to our second speaker uh, of today, uh, Professor Mohamed Balan. Uh, Mohamed is an assistant professor in the Department of History at Stonebrook University. He's a historian of late medieval and early modern uh, of the early the late medieval and early modern Islamic world, and he received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 2019. He previously held positions uh, or appointments as a junior fellow at the Dart Dartmouth, sorry, the Dartmouth Society of Fellows between 2018 and 19, and as a Mellon Faculty Fellow at the Medieval Institute at the University of Notre Dame. Mohammed is working on his first book project, which follows from his PhD research. Uh, entitled Lord of the Pen and Sword, Genealogy and Sovereignty in the Islamic West. And he explores the phenomenon of the scholar statesman, that is the phenomenon of literateurs, physicians, jurists who ascended to the highest offices of state. And he does that specifically through the example, the case of the life and works of the Senate Dean Ibn al-Khatib, who lived in the middle of the 14th century, and who's one of the most prominent Iberian Muslim historians, chancellors, and philosophers um, in this particular time frame. And that's the person and the, the, the scholar and the context that he will also be talking about here today in his case study on Ibn al-Khatib in Nasrid Granada. Mohammed, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Yo. Let me just share my screen. Wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to thank professors uh, Antonella Scorpu and Jovan Stenbergen for organizing today's event and for the gracious invitation to participate. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here today among such esteemed colleagues, and I'll try my best to keep my comments within 10 minutes. Um, so my talk today focuses on the interplay between communal identity, local politics, and historical writing in 14th century Granada. And I I'm sure no one here needs an introduction to the larger context of Nasser Granada, but just to remind everyone, between the 13th and 15th centuries, this kingdom was the last surviving Muslim polity in late medieval Liberia. It was closely connected to both Europe and North Africa, integrated within both Latin Christendom and the Islamic world in this period. Uh, and as you can see here from the Catalan Atlas, it's prominently presented here. Uh, this is the Atlas of 1375. So 
by the 14th century, Granada had been transformed from a regional urban center into one of the largest cities in the Islamic West. And the case of Nasser Granada provides remarkable insight into the various social, cultural, and political processes occurring in the late medieval Islamic world. Whether we're talking about the reconceptualization of sovereignty and political legitimation, new intellectual and religious syntheses, bureaucratization, or the emergence of local identities, this provides an ideal case study for thinking about all of these major developments. One particularly important trend, one that you already mentioned, uh, that animates my research is the rise to prominence of scholar officials. And these were individuals who rose to prominence from being chancellors, treasurers, and physicians to being one of the most preeminent individuals of state. Um, so for much of the 14th century in Nasser Granada, various members of, these, of the secretarial elite in particular, the Qutab, uh, occupied some of the most senior offices within the kingdom and contested power often violently with the established military elite or nobility. And these scholar functionaries were primarily from provincial families, uh, in, including immigrants from Christian Spain who had established themselves in the royal administration, which was increasingly identified with the Alhambra in the 14th century. And this institution, the chancery, became an important avenue for social mobility. So this is the essential context for any study of Ibn al-Khatib's life. So during the first half of the 14th century, five individuals who had begun their careers as financial officers, scribes or physician, rose to the position of wazir, chief minister, the highest executive office within the Nasser kingdom. And by the late 14th century, this had become such a prominent trend that these scholar officials themselves, the participants in this very trend, composed treatises that sought to enshrine this arrangement within both history and political theory, as indicated by this quote, by the late 14th century Nasser scholar official Ibn Simak al-Amili, who himself was an associate of Ibn al-Khatib, who says the appointee to the office of chief minister should be a, co a competent scribe with a knowledge of epistolary and calligraphy, a literature of an expertise in history. So here we have a very clear example of how this becomes normativized within these treatises. And the individual I want to speak to you about today is the Sanadin Ibn al-Khatib, 1313 to 1374 who would rise from his position as scribe position and physician in the Nasrid court to become one of the most powerful chief ministers and chancellors within the kingdom of Granada, exercising supreme control over the military, political, and fiscal spheres between roughly 1349 and 1369. 13, uh, yes, 1369. So Ibn al-Khatib's intellectual network, because he was also a scholar, that's the scholar part of scholar official, a community of letters, we can call it, in the Islamic West, bound together through shared scholarly interest, extensive epistolary correspondence, and ties of patronage and friendship, encompassed Nasr Granada, Christian Spain, North Africa, and the Near East. His historiographical production should be understood as being molded by this larger intellectual and cultural context, and it shapes the representation of Nasr Granada in fundamental ways. And in addition to his leading political and administrative role as Granada's preeminent statesman, Ibn al-Khatib was also the Nasser Kingdom's most prolific historian during the 14th century. He produced a number of historical works, including biographical dictionaries, dynastic chronicles, and a universal history of the Islamic world. Ibn al-Khatib also composes an extensive travelogue, an autobiography, and a family history, illustrating the ways in which he wrote history in a number of registers and across genre, genres, basically. Like many of his contemporaries, he instrumentalized historical writing for various purposes, including the buttressing of his own political authority as an upwardly mobile chief minister, uh, the crafting of a distinct legacy for himself and family, and for articulating a regional and communal identity. It is precisely within his role as historian that we can better understand the importance of a scholar official as a distinct social, political, and intellectual figure within the late medieval Islamic West. Ibn al-Khatib consciously and repeatedly sought to establish his own authoritative role as the leading Nasser historian and his works as an archive uh, for both Nasser Granada and Al-Andalus as a whole. This is demonstrated most clearly by his own declaration that he was the best positioned individual to write a history of the Nasser kingdom and its rulers because he was, quote, the bard of their histories, the axis around which their royal affairs revolve and the archive of their house. The explicit reference to himself as the archive of the Nasser dynasty illustrates the importance that he ascribed to his own role as historian in reinforcing his privileged position within Granada. It also indicates the significance that he attached to the preservation of documents, which acted as a repository of cultural, political, and dynastic memory. 
it was Ibn al-Khatib's privileged access to official correspondence, royal documents, and leading individuals across the Nasrid realm, particularly in Granada, which characterizes his historiographical production. Ibn al-Khatib's extensive administrative intellectual network of scholars and functionaries was the primary means through which he was provided with valuable access to official documents from previous generations. And I can talk more about that and how these documents were preserved in the first place in the Q&A. This self-proclaimed status as the archive of Nasrid history was reinforced by his incorporation of numerous official documents and epistles um, throughout his historical works. And this finds its culmination, this hist historiographical project, in the monumental comprehensive history of Granada, which wove together biography, historical theory, epistolary, autobiography, and political thought into a rich tapestry of the liter literary, social, and political history of the city of Granada itself. And similar to the Muqaddima, this history defies traditional genre classifications and reinforces the inseparability between the realms of historical biographical writing, notions of sovereignty, geography, and a distinct vision of society and politics. The opening pages makes this very clear about how this was a project connected not only to a local sort of identity, but also his own position as Granada's chief minister, as, as a wazir, and as chancellor. And he does write this as a comparativist project. He's thinking about the other histories written across the Islamic world. And it's quite important here to notice how he's identifying Granada as a borderland of Islam, how he talks about Asabiya, how he's using the word Watan, how he's connecting all of this to the what he deems to be the founding moment of Granada with the settlement of the Damascene Junt in 741. These are all things that we can talk about. But you can see in this preface how the exaltation of the virtues of Granada and its inhabitants drew upon religious, ethnological, and genealogical ideas, much like other texts from this period. And the construction of Granada as an idealized Islamic community, um, characterized by genealogical continuity, religious exclusivity, and ethno-cohesion, finds expression in yet another quote from the, this is all from the preface of the comprehensive history. And just because time is getting away from me and we can maybe talk a little bit about these quotes um, uh, in the Q&A, I want to mention that the construction of Granada as an Islamic city state through the fashioning of a local identity that was predicated on descent from Arab Muslim conquerors, the maintenance of traditions of kingship and sovereignty and the flourishing of Arabic culture and urban settlement over six centuries served to bolster the religious image and political status of Granada, particularly in the eyes of contemporaries in the late medieval Islamic world. Let us remember, this is a borderland polity that often existed in a state of alliance or, or, or other arrangements with Castile. So this idea of bolstering its identity and its credentials was deeply important to someone like Ibn Khatib. And it reminds us of how the various worlds and networks in which Nasser Granada was enmeshed shape the particular historiographical representation of the kingdom and its inhabitants. In fact, Ibn al-Khatib had various copies of the comprehensive history of Granada sent to important libraries across North Africa and the Near East, including an ornate manuscript that was deposited as an endowment or waqf in the Khanika of Sa'id al-Sa'ada in Cairo. The most important evidence that it was well known even in Ibn al-Khatib's own lifetime can be seen in a letter written by Baha' al-Din al-Subki, the chief judge of Cairo, around, who died in 1375, to Ibn al-Khatib that lauded the comprehensive history as an incomparable and illustrious work. This letter was carefully transcribed and incorporated into Ibn al-Khatib's own deeds of the notables. As this particular case indicates, Ibn al-Khatib's works were carefully copied at, with the assistance of his students in the chancery and sent to places like Tunis and Cairo to be deposited in various royal libraries, chancery archives, and other repositories of learning. The composition and dissemination of these elaborate works demonstrates his own attempts to consciously establish himself as the foremost authority for the administrative, intellectual, and political history of the Nasser Kingdom. And the widespread reception of the comprehensive history, and this is the last thing I want to say, is indicated by the fact that it quickly became an authoritative source of knowledge among scholars and historians in Mamluk lands for the history of the, of the Nasser Kingdom. For example, the North African historian al Makari mentions that he came across the physical manuscript of the comprehensive history of Granada when he visited Sayyid al-Sa'adat, and described the many commentaries and marginal annotations of various leading scholars in Cairo during the Middle Ages, including Makrizi, Ibn Hajar Asqalani, Shams al-Din al-Sakhawi on his pages. So these scholars in the late medieval Near East would write highly influential histories, including biographical dictionaries, which would shape both the perception of Al-Andalus in in, into the early modern Islamic world, as well as among generations of Western scholars. The comprehensive history has continued to shape scholars in the present and how they've understood 
and interpreted the history of Al-Andalus, which at times has led to the uncritical replication of Ibn al-Khatib's assumptions, categories, and claims. It is essential that we look back at who wrote this work, what the motivations were to better understand this work and its, and its legacies. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. This is all very fascin fascinating material. I'm sure there will be uh, many questions and issues to discuss further. Uh, but first, we'll turn to our third and final speaker of uh, today, um, Sébastien Garnier. Um, we'll, we'll move back sort of, we've moved from Cairo to Granada. Now we'll move back sort of in the middle to Tunisia, uh, uh, where Sébastien Garnier is sort of based. So that's his, his area of research, basically. Uh, Sébastien is a French researcher and aggregé uh, on Arab who took his PhD in history. Um, and his revised thesis has now been published by Brill in Islamic History and Civilization uh, series uh, entitled Histoire, Sahafsi de Pouvoir et Ideologie. In his research, he mainly focuses on this region of Ifriqiya, basically uh, Tunisia and the areas around it, after the 10th century of the Common Era. And his postdoc research revolves around the issue of memories in this era. Uh, Sebastian has recently joined the board of the Journal of Islamic Manuscript, and he now also works with the National Library of Libya on their manuscript collection, uh, where they're cataloging, reporting, and analyzing the collection. He's a founding member of LIPMET, an international academic group that's working on medieval Libya, and that organizes also, it also organizes a monthly webinar. And if I'm not mistaken, the next one will be organized next Wednesday. But today he's here with us, uh, fortunately, and he'll be introducing us to the case of Ibn Shama in mid 15th century Hafsid Tunisia. Uh, Sebastien, over to you. Many thanks. I'm just sharing yes, my screen, so now it should appear. Um, many thanks to all the organizers for making this possible. I'm very happy to be with you tonight. And uh, I will simply talk uh, about uh, Ibn Shama from uh, a sh slightly different perspective. So this is the book, Histoire of Seed, and I will just rely on some of its um, elements. Uh, basically, it consists of uh, one pot uh, translations. Um, I um, made a new edition of uh, the Adilla of Ibn Shama. Uh, based on the old one with um, many revisions and also produced a translation to French. And there are some ancillary uh, texts um, by, um, by its side. And then come also uh, the, um, the analysis, mainly focusing on power and um, the ideology linked to power. And this is what I want to, to share with you tonight. Uh, for the, the people who don't know the Hafsis, which is quite normal, quite common, um, I would simply remember that uh, they ruled Ifriqiya between uh, 1228 and 1574. Uh, they are not the most studied dynasty, um, but they played quite an important role, especially due to the location uh, between um, the western uh, part of, is of the Islamicate and its eastern part. Um, now let's turn back to Ibn Shamma. He wrote his uh, Adilla in 1457. Um, it was the second one about uh, the triad of the restoration. This is the, the period stretching from 1370 until 1488, uh, with Ibn Qunfuth, who wrote the Farisi at the beginning of this century, and the Zarkashi, who wrote his Daulatain uh, relatively at the end of the, the same 15th century. And what is interesting in uh, the Adila of Ibn Shamma is that it's um, a complex pratek support a strong prodomo plaidoyer, and we'll just try to explain this thereafter. And it allows us to study in detail as I wrote the ideological program of this late period. And the, the question I, I simply ask is, what do you write when you serve the Hafsid? And we just uh, see both parts of this question. So this is for the first part. What do you write? It implies uh, thinking about some evolving forms. I will just um, give you a, a short uh, topology of what could be uh, conceived in this, uh, in this respect. The first one, the first possibility, let's say, is simply reporting single events. For example, at the beginning of the 13th century, 
with the arrival of Abu Muhammad Abdul Wahid, who just landed in Ifriqiya, sent by the Almohads, or the Mu'minis, should we say. And um, this arrival has been um, simply uh, retold in detail by Ibn Nakhil, who was his wazir. And you can find it uh, in a later uh, opus, which is uh, the Rihla of uh, Tijani. So you have uh, this first um, possibility. Then you can just, uh, let's say, uh, upgrade and record one uh, full reign. And this would be in the middle of the 13th century with El Ghassani. And I just uh, took the exact formulation, Yudawinu Siyar El Mustansir. So El Mustansir was the second sultan uh, reigning the middle of the um, of the, the 13th century, and Ghassani was his Katib al Alama, and then he, he, he was just reported by Ibn Qunfut who had written um, um, the Siyar of Al Mustansir, so focusing on uh, the important events of Al Mustansir. Then you can imagine uh, that these uh, different texts could be gathered in archives. So uh, we still have to figure out if they look like a chartrier, chart box, or a cartillary, a kind of register. But uh, the same Ibn Qunfuz mentions a Kitab al-Kabir Mutawakkili that would have contained the episode of the Eighth Crusade, which was led against, uh, against Tunis in 1270. Uh, in that respect, this is very important because it could be the step uh, bringing us to um, having enough materials to compose a dynastic saga. And as you see on the screen, it only arrived in the 15th century. So now the question is, why was it so late? What was the 15th century? Was it truly a new golden age, as it is often depicted by these authors? Was it uh, maybe on the opposite, a swan song, maybe the very last moment when you could pen uh, this uh, history? Um, and um, I think something very interesting and that very, um, very much impressed me was the way Maya Schatzmiller was talking about the Marinids and saying that when they arrived um, in, in power, when they simply um, uh, defeated uh, the Almohads, one of their very first um, challenges why, uh, was to, to write a history of the dynasty, even if it was a little bit early. Um, but they needed it against the, the Fassi milieu where they had landed. And it was something very important to see that it simply um, was uh, the answer to a, a critical uh, ideological situation, also political, of course. Now, the second part of the question, when you serve the half seats, and it brings us to the idea of power legitimation, how do they proceed? How does, for example, Ibn Shamma proceed uh, in three parts? And he uh, mobilizes the idea of uh, being um, um, being in, empowered because you have three times the right to do so. First right is the right of the past. We duly inherited Ifriqiya, so this is a legacy, uh, and it relies on the concept of bicephalism uh, that is, um, according to these authors, especially with Ibn Shamma, um, that is to be found at the heart, uh, at the heart, sorry, of al muhadism the Tawheed. For example, Abu Hafs, who is said to have been the, the founding father of the Hafsids, uh, he made the Mahdi, Ibn Tumar, in the 20s. He made the Caliph, the first Caliph, uh, Abdel Mu'min, probably in 1130. And he also allowed his son to become uh, the heir. So he, he helped actually the uh, patrimonialization of the, of the power. Another key figure would be his son, Abu Muhammad Abdel Wahid, who died in 1221, and he is recorded for having pacified Ifriqiya against two uh, main um, political problems uh, that had started at the end of the uh, 12th century, the Banu Ghaniya and uh, Qarakush. Uh, the, the, the man, probably we could uh, talk about that later. So this would be uh, the right of the past. We are here because we inherited the Fraqiyya. Then comes the right of the present. We are here because we do, presently, we, go, we do good deeds. And of course, it reminds us of the first part of Al-Amr bil Ma'roof. So this is uh, the whole evergetism ever that is um, displayed by uh, these sultans, especially these expenses for the benefit of all, what uh, Paul Vane 
called uh, Opera Publica. And you have the Hassanet Mahassan Fadail Manaqib um, that are detailed for uh, specific rulers. And for the uh, dedicatee Abu Amr Uthman, you only find the term Ma'athir. And this is the only thing you find um, for his reign. Nothing political, nothing military. For example, the beginning, of, uh, the building, yes, of madrasa, of uh, um, su su um, water supplies, libraries, but also the care you have with uh, scholars and uh, holy men. And the last right is the right against our en enemies. We maintain order, and this is of course the second part of uh, what had uh, preceded when the Han al Munkar. And basically, this is uh, fighting the Arab um, who are uh, depicted as Haraba bandits and are linked to uh, the Black Legend. This is this famous Dukhul Arab. And uh, this is actually the conclusion of his, um, of his history. So this, uh, I think, could be uh, helpful uh, if we have to think about uh, this question. And I wanted just to, uh, to uh, make some uh, advertisement for next uh, Wednesday, uh, because we will talk about m m history, uh, but in a different way in uh, the, the LibMed webinar. Uh, about a local memory of Tripolitania. So this is something totally different um, compared to what I've been saying right now. And I think it could be uh, quite tricky, quite interesting uh, if you want to, uh, to follow on this uh, discussion. And now I stop, yes, sharing and I'm done. Many thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Sebastian, for introducing us to another very rich and interesting example of how history was being written in the um, southern uh, Mediterranean uh, and how it intersected very strongly with the world of politics. Um, so the floor is open now uh, for questions. Um, and so, uh, but uh, please post your questions in the Q&A platform uh, that you find uh, advertised on um, the um, on the screen, um, but take your time. I'll first, open the floor myself with a little more general questions, question through our three panelists um, and inviting them uh, to think perhaps also a bit of the notion uh, of the community of scholars that um, um, uh, Mohammed referred to and to what extent these three authors uh, Mohammed very nicely, and I think each one of you very nicely brought out this notion of how they very much should be understood uh, in their very specific local uh, context, but at the same time, uh, how they're also related to wider trans-regional trends of scholarship uh, and, and more general uh, history. Uh, could you expand on that, um, uh, especially, I guess, um, um, Sebastian in Goart, Mohammed has, has explained to us already how the legacy of Emin al-Khatib lived on, but perhaps um, Mohammed may also may also want to 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 um, pitch in explaining how Ibn al-Khatib himself may also have been uh, in, influenced by or related to the world of, of scholarship and in particular historical and historiographical scholarship in the writings that he uh, pursued in Granada. So please, uh, anyone who wishes to, to open up the discussion, um, go ahead. Um, yeah, sure, I, I can say something. Um, thank you, yeah, I think that that's, um, when, when I was listening to Muhammad's talk, there were a lot of uh, bells ringing, like, oh, I, I see this happening as well in the, in the work of the historians I work on, uh, and same with Sebastian's talk. Um, and I think indeed this this connection to wider trends of scholarship is, is, uh, is really, um, really important. Um, in the case of Baibras Mansuri, it's, it's quite interesting considering that he doesn't actually have a traditional uh, scholarly background. He, you know, he has a background as a military slave. He was himself a Mamluk um, that then rose through the ranks to become one of the leading um, Amirs of the Sultanate. He was briefly a Dawadar. He was also a, a governor at, at some point. Uh, he got into trouble at some times with politics. But from his writing, it's clear that he also very, very strongly identified with what was happening scholarly speaking in Cairo and, and, and Damascus at the time. His chronicle is full of um, full of poetry, a lot of um, rhymed prose as well. So he's clearly participating in this kind of literary way of writing history that was pioneered by scribes 
in the 13th century, uh, it seems possible that he knew those scribes as well, and that he took um, he took inspiration from what, from what they had been doing. Um, and it's also very interesting that he wrote a hadith work on the site as well, um, which has with this very strong historical layer to it. Um, so, so I think he was definitely trying to participate there um, and to situate himself not only as a uh, as an important political player, but also as a as a, an intellectual that you know wanted to participate in the intellectual field of Cairo and make an impact in that sense. Sebastian or Mohammed, you want to contribute? Sebastian is still yeah. muted. Yeah. Yes. No, it's fine. Yes. Yes, um, if we consider the, the three authors I mentioned, uh, Ibn Qunfuth, uh, Ibn Shammar, and uh, al Zakashi, the interesting thing is that they were very minor people, actually. So we could have expected, of course, uh, important people at the court or, let's say, in the, in the Tunisian um, environment um, who could have written something uh, about the, the history of the Hafsids, either a, a, a major Katib or the, the Hajib, for example, Ibn Tafrajin, or uh, why not also a scholar, well-known scholars like Ibn Arfa, Al-Burzuli, and others. But uh, if you consider, for example, the project of Ibn Qunfud, he was he belonged to uh, the notability of, of Constantina, but he was not a major figure in the in, in, in compared to other, other scholars. And his book was mainly a, um, um, a try to, um, to go back to the good favors of, uh, of the Sultan after the rebellion of uh, Constantina. Uh, if you consider also Ibn Shammar, he was almost uh, a nobody. He's only the son of a Shammar who was not so well known, even if uh, his son tries to make him a, a, a very intimate of the of the sultan, and it was probably Ibn Shama, an obscure um, Khizana keeper uh, caring about the books, uh, so not a, a major figure. And the last one, Zarkashi, is uh, said to have been uh, the, the son of a slave of a former slave who had been um, freed later. And you can very hardly find some trace of, uh, of his activities uh, in Tunis. So this is very interesting because these three characters use history as a way uh, simply to gain favors at the court. But it is not because uh, the Sultan would have requested them to do so. It never appears. It could have been the case, I mean, something unofficial. But um, practically speaking, this is not. So they cannot be uh, at, put at the level of uh, Ibn Khaldun or Ibn Khatib and so on. So this is very interesting. The fact that mainly the Hafsids were not, politically speaking, so much concerned by this uh, issue, writing their own history. And maybe it also explains why it came so late or maybe too late, would say uh, some. And I think it's good if Mohammed also had something. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Mohammed. do you want to pitch in? Yeah, so thank you. Those are all excellent thoughts. And I mean, a lot of it was covered, but for Ibn al-Khatib, absolutely. There's no way we can understand him without having a strong sense of the period that precedes him. Going all the way back to the Taifa period, and I would even contend the Umayyad period in Al-Andalus, but the specifically important moment is the Amuhads. I mean, Amuhad historical writing here needs to really be given a centrality of place where you see the increasing number of Qutab associated with the dynasty that start to write histories, right? Chancery practices that are transmitted directly to the Nasrid period. I mean, Ibn Khatib, Ibn Khatib's teachers are the students of the last generation of Amuhad chancellors, same people, right? I mean, transition, dynastic transition is not so clear cut as our sources would like us to believe, of course. Um, but for Ibn Khatib, influences on him include Ibn Aydari, Malahi, right? Ibn Hayyan, right? He also read, he was very much in tune with what was happening in the Mashriq. And I think this is the part of my research that I'm trying to highlight. He read Dahabi, he read Ibn Kathir, right? Which is actually incredible when you think about how 
contemporaneous he is with these individuals. There was a lot of circulation of books in this period, right? He had specific agents designated in Egypt to maintain lands for him, but also probably, probably to bring books back, right? I mean, there's a lot more to be said on this, on this note. But for me, the fundamental context for his historiographical production has to be his role, his status as an upwardly mobile client of the dynasty who's trying to pass himself off as a nobleman, right? And this is, to me, what's so interesting about this notion of genealogy and lineage within his corpus. And I do think putting him in a conversation with the Marinids, with the Hafsids, is absolutely imperative because I think that's for too long not been the case, um, given that the Marinids are actually stationed in Granada in this period. There are parts of Granada that are under Marinid suzerainty, at least. So thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to follow up on that directly with a question that is put in the Q&A um, that, that, that relates directly to this, this transition, this dynastic, this notion of dynastic transition and how historians um, relate or write about the, the dynasties that precede the dynasty that they are actually writing for, in this case, the Hafsids and the Nasrids and the Almohads, who are the immediately preceding dynasty. Um, the, the question uh, that is put here by Serafim Cabral has to do with the notion of uh, that has been, uh, as he explains, that has been introduced into uh, today's historiography of this Almohadization, of taking, making, or creating distance with the Almohad predecessors. And the question is to what extent, uh, especially of course, um, Mohammed and Sebastian see this, this Almohadization in their studies uh, of the historiography of, and politics of these times. And perhaps we can ex extend the question also and, and, and uh, ask Coart whether he sees a, a similar sort of um, neg more negative engagement with the immediately preceding history of what then is identified as the Turkish dynasty in, his, in his, uh, the, the writings that he's studying. But Mohammed, perhaps you can start. Happy to, yes. Uh, this is a question I'm very interested in, of course, for one reason and one reason mainly. Uh, Ibn al-Khatib visited Tinmal, right? He actually physically went to Tinmal and notes all the sites he saw. He visited what he calls the remnants of the Almohads. And of course, this is in the Marinid dynasty, right, in the 14th century, where they're slowly being effaced. Their legacies are slowly being transformed. So we actually have various ways we can assess how he's looking at the Almohads. When it comes to Al-Andalus, of course, he's engaged in a complete and deliberate process of the Almohadization, even as his own works demonstrate to us the very prominent legacies of the Almohads in every respect, uh, including tit literature. And this is the big part of the book project that I'm engaged in. Um, and this is pretty fascinating in light of one of his contemporaries, Ashatabi, right, who tells us unequivocally in one of his works that he grew up in Granada hearing the Almohad Adhan in the great mosque of Granada, presumably in the mid 14th century. So there's something interesting happening there, right, that I think deserves more attention. I think it's a fantastic question and one that is worthy of investigation. I think we've taken too seriously merited all the Almohadization as emblematic of what's happening elsewhere. And I mean, this is one aspect of, of the work that I'm trying to kind of delve into slowly. It's not my main focus, but it helps us think about legacies and continuities as well as ruptures. Um, so thank you for the question. Sebastian, how do, do you see this also in your, in your uh, writings? Um, the point is that, um, yeah, that's fine. The, the point is that uh, Tunis is very far. And this is the whole story, I think, about the Hapsids. This is very interesting. The way they land there, they simply depict it as um, they had been asked by um, a, a Nasser, the, the, the Caliph and Nasser, to put uh, Ifriqiya in order because it was no longer um, to be accepted what the Ibn Urania and uh, Karakosh had been doing there. And they were also um, th there is the, the whole story about um, the way uh, Abu Muhammad Abdel Wahid is, uh, is just doing a favor to the caliph, maintaining himself there uh, because he is the only man of the situation. And of, of course, you are not obliged to believe it, uh, but it is very interesting uh, just to see how it is set up. And basically what I see is that the Hafsid, uh, they simply managed and it took them some years, it was uh, not very easy for them, especially in the 20s, they just managed to do something very interesting. 
they wanted to sever the ties with, uh, with the Almohads because they wanted simply to run Ifriqiyah uh, on their own. This is quite clear. But also, uh, they needed um, just a, a kind of legitimation. So they just did the minimum. And you see it, for example, in the, um, the whole numismatic uh, corpus. You have very few uh, elements. The only element is uh, the Mahdi. But actually, what is left from uh, Mahdism or al Mahadism in Ifriqiya? Nothing. So this is uh, a tool they use to make themselves uh, appear as legitimate. But they do as much as possible uh, in order to integrate themselves to the Maliki environment, and they succeed very fast. If you read a Tijani who wrote at the beginning of the 14th century, so it means less than one century after their coup d'etat, uh, you simply realize that there is nothing Almohad in this book, almost nothing, let's say. And it's, it's very interesting to see that. And the mentions, for example, of Abd al-Mu'min or Ibn Tumar are very scarce. So this is just another word. And the, the main point for this family, for the Hafsis or the clan, was just to uh, make sure that they would remain in command in the area. And this is what they managed to do. Then, though, then I would say, uh, yeah, Tunis is very far from Marrakesh, and this is probably what happened. Thank you. Thank you very much. Howard, do you have uh, any ideas to share about this notion of dynastic transition? Yeah, um, thank you. Yes, um, I think it's actually really important to understand, especially the work of uh, Bible Solomon Suri. Uh, because as I've discussed, he has these, you know, he has a separate work on the uh, the, uh, the Turkish state, which is what we refer to as the Mamluk state now. Um, and he also, he, he specifically singles off the, that period in a, in a separate volume, which is also something we see in the work of Ibn Dawadari. Um, but I think... Um, I don't think we have anything less that really approaches the 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 the, the, the transition from Almohad to Marinid or to uh, Nasrid. Um, and in fact, I think in all the scholarship, we often had this notion that the, the Mamluk state was kind of a coup d'état uh, that you know that destroyed the Ayyubid Sultanate, and it's kind of a, it's a it's a very problematic regime that needed to be de uh, legitimized. Um, <clears throat> in my book on the early um, period of that that state um i specifically argue that it, it's it's not actually super productive to to focus too much on this idea of legitimization it seems that actually the sultans were not actually um, considered as very un unlegitimate um they, they and if you only read the sources of that period as legitimizing you kind of miss the complex interplay between um, author and uh well, historians and sultans that is at play there um, but I think at the same time, I think by the early 14th century, there was a growing awareness of the fact that this was maybe not quite the same state anymore as it was under the Ayyubids. And this is very clearly reflected in um, by Abbas Mansouri, and I very hypothetically, I worked, maybe this is an early form of Mamlukization, uh, which is what, what, you, what you have written about extensively. Um, but I think uh, by Abbas Mansouri has this idea that there is a distinct state, and he seems to be the first one to do that. Um, and Ibn Dawadari kind of picks up on it as well. Uh, I think, of course, later on, uh, scholars like al Makrizi in the 15th century, Ibn Hajar, they pick up on this much more and they have a much clearer idea of it. But I think Bibras Mansuri does, is, is, is that kind of, a, is pioneering this idea. Um, so yeah, rupture and, and continuity are important themes there as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, we have some more questions, but I think, in view of the time, I need to hand over very briefly to um, Miriam or um, Antonella to wrap up our live session, and then we can continue. And you're welcome to stay on um, for for the other questions that I see here popping up in the Q and A platform. Um, so I hand over first to Antonella. Okay, or not. Okay, that seems to be a bit of a misunderstanding there. Okay, in that case, I just um, I, I just continue. 
I'm happy to do so, great. Um, so another question that was put in the Q&A um, uh, was put there by, by our colleague Mustafa Bannister, and I'm just gonna read it to, to you. Um, can you briefly